Good evening, welcome. You're watching News Central TV. I'm Kofi Bartel. So we begin the news tonight with the headlines. Ahmed Osman Ododo sworn in as new governor of Kogi State. Mali military junta to hold peace dialogue after scrapping deal with rebels. Hundreds of Kenyans march against rising cases of gender-based violence. Those are the headlines. We have details of those headlines and other stories shortly. We begin the news at this hour with politics in West Africa, where Usman Ahmed Ododo has been sworn in as the new governor of Kogi State in Nigeria. The ceremony took place at the Muhammad Buhari Square in the state capital, Lokoja. Ododo will be the seventh civilian to occupy the office of the governor since the creation of the state on the 27th of August 1991, which was carved out of Benue and Kwara states. Ododo, a candidate of the All Progressives Congress, was declared the winner of the election, that's governorship election, on November 12, 2023. Let's head to security matters now. The Ogun State Police Commander says one 37-year-old woman, Bilikisu Kazim, was killed while some others were kidnapped during an attack along the lagos Ibadan Expressway on Friday. The incident reportedly occurred at the Bamboo area along the lagos Ibadan Expressway inward Lagos. Among those kidnapped was a chairman of the Lagos State Chapter of the People's Democratic Party, Philip Ivoji and some other party chieftains. The abductors are demanding 200 million naira for their release. The governorship candidate of the Lagos PDP in the 2023 governorship elections, Abdulaziz Adeniro said, Ivoji was taken by hoodlums, and he described the unfortunate incident as a disturbing dimension to the growing insecurity in the country, especially in the southwestern part of Nigeria. In the meantime, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Abia State University, Uturu, Professor Godwin Emezue, has been kidnapped. Reports say the professor was in the company of his wife at the time of the incident on Friday by around 7 p.m. in Amachara, Umwahia, South Local Government Area of Abia State in the southeastern part of Nigeria. He was said to have been whisked off or whisked away by some yet-to-be-identified men in an SUV and headed towards Imo, Abia border axis. Sources say the wife was spared, but the kidnappers seized her ATM card. And the university registrar, Acho Elendu, confirmed the incident and added that moves uh, were being made to report to the police. The chief of army staff, Lieutenant General Tarid Lagbaja, has arrived Plata State for an on-the-spot assessment of the violent attacks that left many people dead with property worth millions of naira damage. The chief of army staff with his entourage was received or were received by the general officer commanding three division Major General Abdul Salam Abubakar on his arrival. New Central's Chizuba Nioi reports that the chief uh, general, rather, uh, Latari Lagbaja, has paid a courtesy call on the governor of the state, Caleb Muftwang, on his arrival in the state. Now, details of this will be brought to you in our subsequent bulletins. A Lagos Sexual and Domestic Violence Court has sentenced the founder of the I Rain Christian Ministry to life in prison on Friday for raping a church member. The founder, Fee Daniels, was found guilty of rape 
and sexual assault by Raman Oshodi for crimes, as a judge, for crimes committed against a female member at the Lagos based ministry. For more, here's Ni Oboni. The Lagos State Government arraigned Bishop Oluafi Rockwood Daniel before the Sexual Offence Court on a full counts charge of rape contrary to Section 260, Subsection 2 of the Criminal Law of Lagos State 2015. The state claimed that the defendant, the founder of Iran Christian Ministry, allegedly committed the offences sometime in June 2020 at Ikota Villa Estate, Lekki, Lagos. Whether you freeze my account or you pay bloggers to speak against me or to write in newspaper, the Council of Jehovah will stand. The court found Bishop Daniel guilty and sentenced him to life imprisonment on the first count of rape and three years imprisonment on the third count. The court found him guilty of the fourth count charge against the first complainant. They found him guilty of rape. That carried a life sentence. But the court, um, in its wisdom, said that the prosecution did not establish enough evidence in the second count of rape against the second complainant. But the court also, um, further went to find him guilty of sexual assault against the third complainant, but did not find him guilty of attempted rape. We want to say thank you to Lagos State Government for saying no and zero tolerance to any form of gender-based violence. Today is landmark. This is a victory we didn't see coming. We knew we were going to have victory, but we didn't know it was going to be like this. This sentencing comes at a time when more church leaders and pastors are being accused of sexual abuse. It has also told survivors who have been brutalized, who have been, um, um, you know, have one way or the other um, been victimized and traumatized by men of the cloth, that they have a voice and that they, when they talk, we will listen. Justice has been served and uh, this is uh, giving us uh, uh, joy that we can still rely on the justice system of Nigeria. In my own case, and I think that is the only regret I will be having in my life, that I didn't take TB Joshua to court because I was not well guided. Um, as a man, I'm ashamed that um, we still have men who feel they can rape women, they can sexually assault women, and nothing will happen. You go, because he, if you know that the lady you are about to mess up with, if you know this will happen to you, you won't dare. Sexual rights activists believe the position of trust and authority that clergy hold makes these crimes particularly shocking and deserving of serious consequences. The sentencing of Bishop Daniel is seen as a warning for would-be offenders that sexual crimes will not be tolerated, even for those in leadership positions. The expectation is that all institutions must work to ensure a safe environment for citizens. In Lagos for New Central, Ni Omani. The Permanent Secretary and Solicitor General of the Ministry of Justice in Delta State, Southern Nigeria, Omamuso Erebe, has stressed the urgent need to address illegal migration, sexual abuse and child rape and narcotics use in the state. To this end, two special focus units focusing on sexual abuse and illegal migration have been established to prosecute offenders. Arabia affirmed the commitment to collaborate with stakeholders and urged the Delta State Orientation Bureau to conduct strategic campaigns against social vices. He expressed concern over rising cases of sexual or child sexual abuse involving even biological fathers. Uh, the Chief Executive Officer of the Delta State Orientation Bureau, Dr. Wilfred Ogenezibe, recommended the ministry's uh, prosecutorial successes and emphasized the importance of collaboration for effective campaigns. Well, to discuss this now, we're joined by Fred Ladimore Ogenezibe, himself the Executive Assistant on Communications and Orientation to the Delta State Governor. It's good to have you on the program tonight. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, first question, what specific measures have been implemented by uh, the Delta State Ministry of Justice under the leadership of uh, Omamu Zoyarebe to, to address the escalating issues of illegal migration, sexual abuse, 
uh, and narcotics use, particularly when you talk about the establishment of two uh, units on, of which focus on sexual abuse and illegal migration? Uh, uh, the ministry has done so well. Uh, Umamuzo's leadership has been very productive. And uh, the state government is really pained by the series of uh, cases on sexual abuse and illegal migration. And this is very disturbing. Uh, the governor of the state uh, is worried seriously about this development, and he wants the orientation agency, in collaboration with other stakeholders, to intensify campaign and put up measures to uh, see that this menace is caught. In Delta, uh, there are a series of arrests that have been made so far, and uh, there are so many uh, <clears throat> matters in court, uh, not only on sexual abuse, but social abuse in a different dimension, in the sense that fathers of these young girls, some fathers who are supposed to be protective of their daughter, are now also, you know, uh, having carnal knowledge of their own daughter. Some of these children are between the age of five and 10 years. And the Minister of Justice is uh, particularly handling one of such, uh, uh, you know, uh, cases right now. Uh, the most sad aspect of it is that when this uh, matter is brought to court, you find that the, the parents are always not, right, they are not cooperating enough because uh, they will say that uh, their daughter will be stigma size or when society get to know that this girl has been raped or molested or violated, uh, it will tell on her future. But the new law on, on rape the, does not give that exposure to the children because one, they will need to exclude them. Two, they have to cover their faces or their uh, faces during trials. So it does not give room for uh, that kind of exposition that uh, the, the, some of the parents complain about. But right away in Delta, the Minister of Justice is not really bothered about whether or not uh, the parents are cooperating. We are pushing further and we are going to push more to ensure that uh, our children are not um, unnecessarily uh, molested and um, raped you know, at their tender age and even at their adulthood. Uh, well, for the uh, illegal migration, uh, the government is very tense about that. Uh, there's a case that we pursued all the way to Europe recently where uh, a girl was deceived by a group of women and then she was taken away only to, to be engaged in forced labor. And uh, she had a way of uh, contacting the mother. The mother came to us and uh, the, you know, the matter is, is pending in court. And the, the perpetrators of that uh, crime, the two ladies involved, they are cooling off right now at uh, Okere prisons in Wari. So as far as we are concerned, we are going to give this matter a very serious treatment and we are not going to uh, let anybody intimidate us. Quite interesting and encouraging. Uh, uh, in response to rising cases of child uh, sexual abuse, you know, rape and defilement mentioned by the Solicitor General, uh, how does he envision the collaboration between the Ministry of Justice and the Delta State Orientation Bureau in curbing uh, uh, these social vices? And, and what role does he expect the Bureau to play, you know, in reorienting the youth population about the dangers associated with these issues? The, the role of the Orientation Bureau is very simple. We are trying to take these campaigns to both primary and um, higher institutions of learning. Uh, we are doing, uh, we, are, we are in the process of producing radio and TV commercials at this moment to educate our children that uh, when their parents, particularly the father, uh, is trying to touch them in sensitive places, they should be bold enough to talk to their mother and talk to those around them. That look, oh, look, daddy is touching me in this way, uh, uncle is touching me that way, brother is touching me this way, our driver is touching me like that, like this. They should be able to speak up. So the campaign we are going to do is going to be massive. It's going to be on radio and television. We are taking it to the schools and to let people know that when you have uh, people playing around you in such a funny manner, it is your right to report them to either to your parents or to the nearest adults close to you that can be able to take up the matter. So the agency and the, and the Minister of Justice, what we try to do is that as we, as we go out to talk to these children and the students, uh, we give a room for them to 
ask questions. We also give them a room for them to see us privately. And, you know, we have a section where uh, on one-on-one -on -one basis, those who want to make some confessions, those who want to tell us what they are going through, they are free to tell us. And when we receive this kind of information, we now channel it to the Minister of Justice. The Minister of Justice and the law enforcement agents, they will take up the matter from there. Interesting. Yeah, Fred, with the em emphasis on collaboration and partnership between the Ministry of Justice in Delta State, the Delta State Orientation Bureau, uh, and various stakeholders, uh, what specific uh, strategies or strategies and initiatives are being proposed to you know, create awareness uh, about the dangers and the legal implications of human trafficking, like you mentioned, rape, and even narcotics use across Delta State? Yeah, you're right. Uh, you know that the root of all these crimes uh, is, uh, is embedded in the use of narcotics. Um, illicit drugs and, um, uh, and all that, they, they, they contribute majorly to this uh, out of uh, uh, criminality. Because as you know it, uh, before they go about some of these crimes, they will, first of all, will have to take all manner of drugs, uh, not only marijuana this time, they have so many kinds of uh, illicit drugs that they now use these days. And uh, those drugs are very dangerous, dangerous to their own health too, and at the same time, in terms of uh, pushing them to commit some of these crimes. Then um, the, we have also, we have a working relationship now with the Nigerian um, Law Drugs Enforcement Agency, NDLEA, and uh, last week, I was with the Commandant, Delta State, uh, Delta State Commander, uh, Mr. Uh, Wada Abubakar. And we also agreed that um, uh, we have to intensify efforts in the campaigns and arrests. And to that effect, uh, the rehabilitation center in um, uh, Kuala uh, will, be, will be attended to by the governor. Because that rehabilitation center and uh, and, uh, and the counseling center, we also help a great deal because when some of these drug addicts are arrested, the end users are arrested, uh, and also the, the dealers, what happens is that they go through a process. And that process of counseling and uh, rehabilitation for those who are willing to give up use of drug, uh, we need to be done in that rehabilitation center. Uh, to that extent, uh, there will be, we, we need a skill acquisition program at, at those centers so that when those of them who are like, going um, that process of rehabilitation can also at the same time learn skills because we have come to also realize that most of these people who are indulging these um, drugs and uh, rapes and all of that, some of them are jobless. Uh, majority of them are not uh, people that uh, have a headway in life. So the re rehabilitation will help us to also now redirect their their mind towards becoming better citizens. And we, another way of doing it is to make sure that uh, they have skills so that at the end of the training, government will give them standard parts and help them to start a new life. So that is also part of, of the program. Then as for the publicity of creating awareness, I've told you, you know, the social media is very massive now. The audience of social media is very, very huge because some of these youths, they all have uh, telephones, they are on social media. So we try to intensify campaigns on social media, telling them to stay away from drug, the dangers of drug. And uh, if they are being coerced, uh, you know, to partake in some of these crimes or, or to even start taking drugs, we have dedicated lines that we're going to put on the social media platforms that they can call or send messages silently. And then the NDLEA uh, and the Orientation Bureau will uh, team up together to make sure that uh, some of these messages that okay. we receive uh, we we harmonize them and then you know go about uh, you know right. tracking down those who are forcing people to trade take drugs and where they are selling those drugs right. because those lines will tell you that look if you see where they are selling drugs say something right. text us send a message to us that there is a cartel here there is a local seller right. here there is a retailer here there is a major dealer here all right and then we'll be able to Th thank you very much uh, Fred Latimore organize we we have to leave with that. You spoke like a real uh, orientation man, and I know you're doing a good job along with the others in Delta State. Thanks for really uh, uh, giving us uh, a breakdown of what is going on in Delta State. It seems quite interesting, something that other parts of the country can emulate. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank you.
We'll go back to more gender-based violence stories later on the news. But uh, true education matters now. Uh, 1,000 orphans and other less privileged persons in Jere, local government area of Nigeria's northeastern Borno state, now have a cause to smile as they all have received a scholarship to write the university matriculation examination in Nigeria. Uh, this offer was made possible by a federal lawmaker representing their constituency with an aim to support their quest to obtain higher education. New Central's Umaru Kirawa has more. The scholarship beneficiaries, comprising orphans and vulnerable persons, were selected to ensure that those facing the greatest hardships, particularly those whose parents were murdered during the Boko Haram insurgency, were given priority. They come from various backgrounds, including displaced persons camps and host communities. So if this initiative continues, many of us will uh, get uh, sponsorship and we have a lot of uh, students that have good career and backgrounds, but due to lack of money. So that's why many of them, did, uh, they are not getting sponsorship in their education and so on. Many people can, can, cannot offer someone to defer our jam registration, but he promised to it if we get more score that, or more than 200, so he will pay our registration for university. So we'll try, so we'll try so that we can see, we we'll get more than 200. Jam is now 6,200, and the people affected with insurgency in the state cannot afford to maybe have access to that jam. But for, by giving them free of charge, they will now have access to go and register free of charge. So that is why we are now deciding to give them that form uh, with the assistance of the engineer, Satomi Ahmed. And uh, all this is in line with the renewed hope of the President Bela Ahmed Tunumbu, the, Pedro, the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, with the exemplary leadership of the Professor Bawana Omar Azulum, MNI FNSC, the Executive Governor of Borno State. The scholarship is said to cover the entire cost of jump registration, allowing these young aspirants an equal chance at pursuing the dream of a higher education with their peers. We will scout for the best, particularly those that want them to become medical uh, students and engineers. Uh, the constituency office will make sure uh, we have secured an admission for them and if need to be able to pay their schools. So this is the sixth time we are doing this. This time around they have fathers, parents that will take care of uh, their education entirely. And I'm very much happy for the turnout. This shows that uh, our young upcoming ones are ready to queue in uh, to the educational uh, project of Jerry Federal Constituency. By offering the youngsters scholarship to write the joint admissions and matriculation board examinations, this serves as an essential step towards the recovery efforts in the troubled northeast region and an attempt at renewing the hope of those most affected by insurgency. In Jerry for New Central, Umori Kirawa. Thank you, Maru. Let's move away from that now to bring you uh, a sad story. The body of late Sylvester Oromoni Jr., who reportedly died on November 30, 2021, at a private hospital in Wari Delta State after alleged health complications at Doan College, his school uh, in Lagos, is being conveyed to final rest at Ogbe Ijo in Delta State. Uh, the 12-year-old had died on the 30th of November, 2021, as we said, after allegedly being attacked by some senior students uh, for refusing to join a call. The Central's correspondent, Austin Azu, who is covering the burial rights of the late Sylvester, brings us more details. All right, we have him joining us now. Uh, good evening to you. Um, Austin has, uh, please bring up to, us up to speed with what happened at Ogbe. Uh, Ijo, today has Sylvester been laid to rest already? Uh, good evening to you. Yes, of course, it's really a sad moment in worry and the environs all over the country because the final bare right of uh, this Sylvester Oganenyeru uh, Oromuni Jr. was conveyed mm -hmm. from uh, the hospital this morning, passed through various roads, amidst tears from passerbys, family members, and friends of the family. 
and it was conveyed from the jetty side down to Obujo. And finally, he was laid to rest about uh, 3 20 uh, p.m. this afternoon. It's really a sad moment because uh, the father who spoke, midst of tears, the family members couldn't hold back their tears, seeing their, their son be laid to rest. You know, it has been on two years and seeing the cops again, we are waiting a lot of things concerning the young boy who had a bright future. And the father spoke about him and the biography of this late young boy was so heartwarming. Uh, from the heart, from the from the biography, we are told that the boy was uh, so kind, so generous to his colleagues, fellow students, even to an extent he has to influence the payment of their school fees, and not only that, to some of their teachers who couldn't afford the accommodation too. So it's really a sober reflection for some persons from that uh, uh, funeral service. Yeah, the priest who conducted the funeral service, everyone to be very generous, whatever they have, what they can give to society, because this formed the basic why they will be remembered for here on earth, irrespective of their age and status, and thereafter, um, life after earth here. But so far, so good. Uh, the son who came, uh, one of those uh, legal team for the case for late Sylvester Romano Jr., uh, S.A.N. Palana, equally gave the hope that uh, the, the outcome of the investigation will be made known before the end of April this year. And as soon as it's made known, they so much believe that uh, by the grace of God, they will get justice. And the father too equally collaborated that where he told journalists about what he intends to do there uh, you know and not only that so the question was asked how come you are laying your son to rest after two years why didn't you take him to uh, convey him to mother earth immediately after he was he was pronounced dead so he said of course that he he promised the child that if he's going to he's going to take him 30 years to fight for justice and on that he maintains that that he will continue to stand on that you know, that premise that it's just two years and uh, it's very optimistic that uh, it will get justice, that uh, the child did not die a natural death. And those behind the circumstances that led to the early death of his son, that all of them were brought to book. He gave good names about the son, that he used to call his son daddy, he used to call his son daddy, and just like that, they have a very, you know, father and son relationship. He couldn't hold back his tears. You can see everywhere you go, it's just like forever in our hearts. It means that this boy has actually, you know, sent a, a message across that it's not your age that you live that matters. It's the impact you are able to make. Little as uh, late Sylvester Romino, at 12 years, was able to impart little lives around him from students from Dawn College who can testify to that and from his own parents, friends, and relatives. And to God be the glory, finally, late Sylvester Romino Jr. has been laid to rest today at his country home, Obujo, in Warwick Southwest, local government area of Delta State. All right, Austin, uh, thank you so much for bringing us up to speed with uh, the burial of the late uh, Sylvester Romino Jr. at uh, Obujo in Delta State. Uh, we must stress uh, that also the investigation has not been concluded and uh, of course court has not uh, given judgment on, uh, as to who is responsible despite the allegations that we mentioned uh, in, in the story. Austin Azu, uh, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Right, we'll go on a quick break and uh, when we return we have more stories ahead. Please stay with us. Welcome back. Let's uh, turn attention to Mali, where the military hunter in that country is set up a committee to organize a national peace dialogue 
after it scrapped a key 2015 peace deal uh, with Northern Separatist Group following uh, hostilities. Algeria was the main mediator in the efforts to return peace to Northern Mali following the agreement signed in its capital in 2015 between the Malian government and predominantly Tuareg armed groups. However, the military appointed head of government, uh, Shuguel Kokala uh, Maiga, in a video posted on social media on Friday, said there will be no negotiations outside Bamako as it will no longer go to a foreign country to speak about its problems. The Algerian broker deal had already begun to unravel last year when fighting between the separatists and the Mali government troops broke out in August after eight years of calm. A say in West Africa, Burkina Faso has agreed or has received 25,000 tons of wheat from Russia as part of the 200,000 tons promised by President Vladimir Putin to several African countries. The donation was announced during a pledge made by the Russian president at the second Russia-Africa summit held in St. Petersburg in July last year. Burkina Faso's Minister of Foreign Affairs says the aid is one of several testimonies of how the cooperation between his country and Russia aligns with the aspirations of the people. La présente cérémonie marque l'accomplissement d'une promesse faite en juillet 2023 par son Excellence Monsieur Vladimir Poutine à la faveur du sommet de Saint-Pétersbourg. La cérémonie du jour est un des nombreux témoignages de l'excellence de cette belle coopération qui n'a que de belles promesses alignées sur les aspirations des populations. Des quantités de blé ont été également livrées en Érythrée, au Mali, en République centrafricaine, en Somalie et au Zimbabwe. En 2023, le Mali a été approvisionné en céréales, carburant et engrais à titre d'aide humanitaire. Notre pays va continuer à contribuer non seulement à l'approvisionnement du Burkina Faso des produits de première nécessité, mais à son autosuffisance alimentaire, énergétique et technologique via le transfert de nos expertises, compétences et savoir-faire. In Kenya, several hundred people marched in Nairobi, the capital, on Saturday to protest femicide in Kenya, where over a dozen women have been killed this month in cases that shocked the nation. At least 16 women have been killed in Kenya this year, according to media reports shining a spotlight on violence against women, which the government has described as rising. One of the cases that gained nationwide attention, a 26-year-old woman was killed on January 4 at a short-term rental apartment by a suspect who police say is part of an extortionist gang which targets women through dating sites. Barely a fortnight later, a 20-year-old woman was strangled, dismembered, and remains stuffed into a plastic bag. Two men are in police custody over the case, but are yet to be charged. I come from a family of women, but beyond my relationships, I'm aware that you know women are not safe. There's what's been happening in the news, but it's not a new issue really. You know, last year over 700 women suffered intimate partner uh, deaths because of intimate partner violence. You know, uh, or if you have seen anybody who has signs of uh, maybe they are too entitled to a woman and her identity and her person, call them out, talk to them. These are. Let's go to other stories. Performers attending the Kalahari Arts and Heritage Festival have expressed great excitement using the event to tell the world about the importance of the sun culture and the African origins. The festival is an annual event in the Northern Cape province that celebrates the indigenous sun communities of South Africa in music, dance and arts. Mbongani Siziba has more. The day started with mentorship activities on how to preserve the sun cultural heritage. 16 groups from Botswana, Namibia, and South Africa 
are here to draw knowledge from each other, share ideas and have fun. The festival is important because I want to show our culture for other people to see and people who are there at the festival to go and talk there around where they are come from. I'm an actor, I'm also a singer and why I'm doing this is because I love acting and singing because I want to put our sun culture forward. Maybe dancing if it's possible. <laughs> uh, but I'm here to, to, to tell people about my tradition and show them how to make my tradition and jewelry and all the things. With vibrant music and dances just to showcase their rich culture at the background, the flickering flames casting enchanting shadows on their joyful faces. The campfire burning at the background in this lively gathering. It is important or in, in, imperative to preserve the sun culture that it originates from uh, Namibia. We took it from Namibia, but we are doing it our way in Botswana and we are proud to be saving it for the younger generation. The future of tomorrow lies in our hands as the youngsters. I think it is important for us to be dancing like this so that our culture don't get we should keep on going on with our culture, try and, you know, as the young ones are growing up like that, we should make sure that our culture does not, we don't get lost on the way. We really love our DNC. The Sun people have come together to honor their heritage and share it with the world. The festival has beautiful, captivating dances each move representing different aspects of Sun's life. These dances tell stories, express joy, and celebrate their ancestral connection to the land. It's truly breathtaking to witness. This song is just full of love, full of happiness and peace. Peace is in this dance. This is where you can actually find peace and happiness because it's an, I don't know, it's just a beautiful feeling. The sons have preserved their traditions for centuries, passing them down from generation to generation. This festival is a testament to their resilience and the beauty of their customs. As the night progressed, the music and dance grew more spirited. The beats of the drums echoed through campsite, weaving a spell-binding tapestry of sound and movement. The energy here is palpable and I can feel the connection, the music that is played here, it brings people together. This show of tonight is just a glimpse of what to come, as various groups here prepare to showcase their talents at annual Kalahari Arts and Heritage Festival on Saturday. In the Kalahari Desert, Northern Cape in South Africa, for News Central, Wangani Siziba. Mugani Sisiba there is showing her what her dad's steps are like. Well, you're watching New Central now, still ahead. Germany's new left-wing party calls for negotiations with Moscow to end the war. We'll bring you the details of this after the break. Please stay with us. Welcome back. Germany's new radical left-wing populist party, Allianz Sarah Wagenknecht, has a call for negotiations with Moscow to end the war in Ukraine. Co-president of the party, Sarah Wagenknecht, made the call at its first congress after the formation of the party split off from the existing left-wing Die Linke and was launched in October by Wagenknecht, a member of the lower house of the German parliament, after her own name. Und für unsere Freiheit sollen die Ukrainer weiter leiden und sterben und wir liefern ihnen die Waffen bis zum Sieg, an den nur leider selbst die ukrainischen Generäle nicht mehr glauben. Ich finde, das ist eine so unverantwortliche, menschenverachtende Politik. Dieser Krieg muss beendet werden. Und zwar ganz schnell auf dem Verhandlungsweg. Und das wäre, weil auch das ist unsere Aufgabe, dass diese Kriegspolitik aufhört. Und das ist ein ganz wichtiger Punkt für unsere neue Partei.
Let's turn our attention to sports now. The Super Eagles of Nigeria will face the indomitable Lions of Cameroon in the round of 16 at the ongoing African Nations Cup on Saturday. Nigeria reached the knockout stage after defeating Guinea-Bissau by a single goal. Now, it's been 40 years since the Super Eagles of Nigeria lost to Cameroon in the final of the 1984 Cup of Nations. Well, four decades later, both teams will meet again in the second round of the ongoing tournament. Fans in Abidjan, the Ivorian city, spoke ahead of the heavyweight clash. I mean, there's a lot of history when you look at both countries, and um, Cameroon, a very physical side, Nigeria, with the kind of the depth and the squad that you have, like no any other squad in this tournament. So it's going to be a very tight call tomorrow. We expect to see some physicality. We expect to see some bit of technical, you know, uh, prowess between both coaches. Uh, well, I think Cameroon, those players are really determined. This is like the second chance, so uh, I, they, have, they are really strong and they will give everything to, to pass this, this term. I see that it going to be, uh, the match is going to be a very difficult one, a very difficult one, and um, uh, Nigeria will need to uh, read Cameroon very fast before it is too late, and uh, Cameroon equally will need to make sure that they don't conceive because Nigeria is having a good um, defense line and to penetrate might, might be very, very difficult. That's why Nigeria has conceived very, uh, very uh, little goals. If you add one plus six, it gives, it gives you seven. For students of numbers, seven is the perfect number. And uh, I don't know whether the Eagles can find the perfect game. And they need it this time uh, because they are playing a perennial rival. They are playing a team that has gone to a bit of uh, darkness and they are beginning to see a little light and they want to literally illuminate everywhere. And that light can only shine if we allow them. And so you have Cameroon, Nigeria, any day, any time. This is a game for emotions, a game for, the, for those with the heart. And you have a Rigo Besson who is coach who understands the drama and the dynamics of uh, managing a team like Cameroon because as captain, Many will not forget that night in Lagos when he carried that cup away. And perhaps uh, this is the time to hit him back in a way. Of course, Nigerians uh, cannot forget that uh, match in a hurry. Well, all the best to both teams. And that's all at this hour right here on East Central Africa. Before we go, let's take another look at some of the stories. Ahmed Usman Odoro has been sworn in as the new governor of Kogi State in Nigeria. The Mali military junta is set to hold peace dialogue after scrapping a deal with the rebels. And we told you that hundreds of Kenyans have marched against rising cases of gender-based violence in that country. I'd like to hear from you. Please safely send us your eyewitness reports using the WhatsApp number and email address on your screen. You can also give us a follow on the major social media platforms. We're at New Central TV. And watch New Central live on any of these channels or platforms. Thanks for your time tonight. My name is Kofi Bartels. Thanks for watching.